Good morning. Good morning. I'm the Reverend John Romick, and welcome everyone to our online worship service. I'm glad that you are able to join us today, and uh, this is definitely a unique time as we are uh, here in an empty sanctuary, except for a few folks. Um, we have Josh, our sound guy here, running the sound, and uh, the Romick family working the words and the live stream. And uh, Alex, our worship team leader, is here as well, as, as along with Mike, playing the drums. And overtaking your prayer request is Tanya, and she's right over there, in case we want to see her. Uh, but anyways, we'll get to her in a little bit. So uh, what I want you to do right now, my friends, is if you're watching, uh, you can, in a comment section, uh, type in your prayer request, say hi, wave to each other, talk to each other. Let this be a community, a time where we give each other virtual hugs and hearts and love and, and things like that. So you also may know somebody in your life who needs to uh, be hearing some good news and uh, during these anxious times. And uh, I encourage you that, that if you could text them right now or give them a call and encourage them to come to our Facebook page or the website to watch uh, today's worship service. So we have a combination of songs, uh, hymns, and scripture, and the message, and we're going to be focusing today on Matthew 7, verses 21 through 29. And But we want to start off with some, some scripture today from Psalm 40. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 40, verses 1 through 4. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me from the desolate pit out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. And many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. There were some articles in the Christian century that, that were really appropriate and give words to the fear that we are hearing, um, and feeling, experiencing today. And it really gets at our sense of worship and what it means to be church, because many of you have gone to church for years and years and years, or perhaps you're new, but a lot of what we're used to doing on Sunday and connecting with each other as human beings is different now. So here are these words from a couple articles that I've taken from recently from the Christian Century magazine. Worship embodies the belief that God's grace comes through physical contact, the watering, trickling down of forehead during baptism, or bread that dissolves on a tongue for communion, juice tickling the back of a throat, one person's hand squeezing another. While the closing of public worship and church-based outreach as a mean separation from God, there is a real grief around the suspension of these tangible forms of connection to Christ and to others. This global pandemic is laying bare what the church has long confessed, that all of us, all people, are deeply and inextricably connected to one another, like branches on a vine. Our interconnection creates mutual vulnerability. As Christians, we are learning or perhaps relearning how to continue to be the body of Christ. It remains the church's work, our work, to nurture human connections with God and with others, even in times of this physical separation. My friends, as you know, this is not a time to take a vacation from our organized church attendance. On Sunday, we usually express our care to each other through the hugging and handshakes and high fives and fellowship hour, playing games in the multi-purpose room and, and taking Holy Communion together. These are lifelong, meaningful practices that we partake of, and it's tough to let go of these. We gather now for Bible studies via Zoom and online, and we worship by phone in what you're doing now. Our practice of prayer and fellowship is getting new life as we use old technologies like calling each other and sending cards and letters. We speak to each other now in words of love through our email, our texts, and our social media posts. Our justice and social outreach takes shape in the form of dropped off meals and digital donations that balance an abundance of caution with an abundance of care. People are struggling everywhere with all kinds of decisions in their lives right now. None of us are immune from that. 
So amid this crisis and uncertainty, the jagged edges of relationships are starting to show. Our futures feel like they're on hold or they're tossed around by the storm. Weddings and graduations, vacations, starting new jobs, trying to sell a home, our businesses, even funerals are all delayed and impacted. There's the layoffs, closings, we worry about our finances. People, we, you, your neighbors, your friends are feeling anxious. Those who have not been isolated are now feeling isolated and those for whom loneliness has been a regular adversary is going to battle it even more. We don't just go to church for the sermon or for the music. We go because we seek connection. And church reminds us of our belonging. It reminds us that we belong to God and that we belong to each other both to see others and to be seen by others. It's a vital way in which we see and feel connected to and seen by God. So my friends, this is different and, and challenging times for all of us, but I love the way in which we are trying to be the church, reaching out, calling each other, running errands for each other, dropping off stuff. I, I had folks, uh, a couple people, I'll bring my family some, some toilet paper, I'll tell you, which was, which was awesome. And so I love how we continue to reach out and help each other. And uh, who knows what it means for Easter and Palm Sunday, but we'll, we'll continue to, to, to work on that. And so my friends, as we worship, again from the psalm, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined to me and heard me cry. He drew me from the desolate pit out of the miry bog and he set my feet upon a rock. Today we're going to be talking about how we are set on the rock and our foundation is, is our, our God who's our rock and our fortress. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. And we're going to praise God today with the songs and the hymns that we sing. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. So we are going to be humble we're going to praise God. We're going to worship the one who loves us and through each other, um, continue to give each other that confidence and love and support uh, that God asks us to be as we are the light and salt of the world and we are the church. So, and with Psalm 62, we're going to read verses 1 and 2 and then go down to verses 5 through 8. For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall never be shaken. For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor, my mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people, and pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. And during this time where we are trying to figure things out, our faith can certainly be shaken. And I'm not here trying to motivate you and say, hey, we can do this. I know we can do it. We're going to trust in God and we're going to support each other, but we're also going to acknowledge that this is a pretty tough time. And we're all trying to figure things out what's best for us and our families. But if we can take time each day to go to the Lord in prayer, to be silent, to know that God is taking care of us, but we know the storms are going to hit us. Jesus says that. We'll have troubles for each day. The storms will come. Listen to what is happening now with what in, in, in the, you know, we just had the rains and the floods in this area. And so as this is happening, we can be shaken. But it is in God whom we place our trust. And so my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. 
So yes, these storms are going to hit us, but as a faith community, as a church, we're going to care for each other. We're going to care for this community, care for our friends and our neighbors. And we're going to know that God is the one who's giving us the strength and the power to do this. Last night, as I was getting ready to go to bed, I was sharing with my wife, Tracy, that I was, that I was nervous. I was worried. I was concerned about what, what was today going to be like. And she said, you know, what the word that keeps coming to me is that you need to trust. And um, so that's kind of what we went to sleep on that word. And when I got up this morning, I was reading my devotional. And it, for those who, who have the Jesus Calling devotional, today was all about trust. I just thought that was how awesome God, last thing I heard, first thing I got up, was the word to trust. So we're going to trust in this time of unknowing. That's what we're going to do. Amen. So as you know, we are working our way through Matthew, and uh, we're in chapter, the end of chapter 7, which is the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Next week, um, we will be skipping towards the end of Matthew so that we can cover the scriptures related to the passion or to the uh, trial, uh, betrayal, betrayal, trial, crucifixion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as we get into the Sundays leading up until Easter. But today we're on Matthew 7, verses 21 through 29. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on a rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Now when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes. So we hear in this parable, this ending teaching of Jesus Christ. So a story about the wise man and the foolish man, the person who built their house upon a rock and upon the sand. And so we can kind of see there the uh, way that it illustrates this concept of uh, where do we build our house, on the rock or on the sand? So let's look at this passage. So when we look at this, in verse 21, we, we hear God, you know, Jesus starts saying, that, you know, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, again, we need to look back because the, the, the section of Scripture got changed, um, gets cut off in the, in the lectionary, and it really refers back a little bit where this, the teaching was about being aware of false prophets. So we need to connect that, going really back to verse 15 forward. But let me ask you um, uh, th this question. As we are learning today and hearing this good news, are you going to carry this good news out to others? Are you going to share this? In other words, what you have inside of you um, this love and this good news, are you willing to share that and let others catch that from you, right? In this, in this season of being aware or, or concerned about what we're carrying or what we might catch from other people. So the challenge is, what are people going to catch from you? Hopefully they're going to catch some, some energies, some God's love and good news that you're going to share with them. Now, I had a question uh, from somebody. As you know, I texted out to a uh, bunch of folks saying, when you read the scripture, when you hear about the house and the sand and the rock, what does it make you think of? And you guys share some awesome, awesome personal um, uh, understandings of the scripture. And we've provided those. So if you go to our website and click on the pink uh, COVID-19 button, I've taken those and put about three pages of your responses on there, 
And um, so you can see those and encourage you to read them because some really good takes on what this scripture means to each one of us. And somebody asked me the question, did you pick the scripture for today? And the answer is, uh, well, not really, but sort of. What do I mean by that? It was back in early January when I mapped out all of Matthew that this section of scripture was chosen for today. Who would have known nobody that we would be in this situation that we are today? Who would have known that on Friday it flooded around the church? It flooded a local church, you know, not far from us and that the rains came and the storms are upon us. And so that is, folks, the storm is upon us that Jesus talks about here and it is blowing against us. The rains are coming, the floods, waters are rising. What are we going to do? How are we going to respond? So when we look at this scripture, we are at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, right? Chapter 8 begins a, a, the new part of the ministry of Jesus Christ. We wrap up with the Sermon on the Mount, which started back in chapter 5 with the Beatitudes. And Jesus said with the Beatitudes that there's a blessing to find on all those who find themselves beaten down in life and for doing God's work, yet still seek a way to live the life that Jesus taught us. And so it's the end of the Sermon on the Mount that we find sort of this eschatological choice, this end of time choice. Are you going to follow the ways of Jesus Christ or not? Because both builders heard the teachings of Jesus. Both builders had a chance to build a house. One put the words of God into action. The other didn't. So when we look at wisdom literature, Proverbs, um, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, and uh, in the Psalms, so we have um, where these terms of like house and storm have meanings. And so a, a scripture that you can write down and look up is Proverbs 9, 1 through 6. This talks about wisdom's house and the call for those to enter it. Proverbs 9, 13 through 18 talks about the foolish or folly's house and the call for those to enter it. And so, again, that's Proverbs 9, 1 through 6, and Proverbs 9, 13 through 18. So the wise person, when we look through, liter through the wisdom literature, through uh, the Bible, are those, the wise person is the one who's fearing the Lord, loving the Lord, following the Lord, turning from evil, accepting correction, and gaining understanding. That's the wise person. The house represents human life as part of a larger world, ordered either to God's will or into opposition to what God is seeking for your life. And then the storm are the lives of the righteous that are assailed by the wicked in misfortunes of life. Another scripture for you to write down and look up would be Psalm 69, verses 1 through 4, which kind of talks about these storms that come upon those who are seeking the way. Because we know that God, it just, it, that God provides the sun and the rain for all people on the earth. In the same way that the words of Jesus are taught to everyone, everyone has a chance to hear. The wise then put that into action. So when we talk, you know, to use a really big fancy word, eschatological, this sort of end time, what do you can do with your life? You've heard these, the Sermon on the Mount, you've heard the sermons of, and teachings of Jesus, then what are you going to do? How do we put that into action? Because again, Jesus said in verse 21, um, which parallels which the same part, which is in Luke chapter 6, beginning with verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I tell you? In Matthew, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. And so what does this mean? So Jesus is again warning us when we go back to verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. A good tree bears good fruit. And so this is the difference here are those who are sort of proclaiming one thing on the outside, but inwardly 
don't have that commitment to put the teachings of Jesus Christ into action, to change their life, to follow the ways of Jesus and live according to the kingdom of God here on this earth, right? So Jesus discerns that they lack that inner will. They lack a commitment to what they profess. They are not what they seem. And as Jesus said in chapter 7, verse 13, they're on that easy road to destruction. They take the easy way out. You know, many of you shared with me that it's easy to sort of build your house upon the sand. That The sand is shifting and changing and it's easy to dig into. And, and that's sort of the easy road in life. Following Jesus Christ does take some tenacious discipline and some willingness to change your life that may go against sort of what seems to be the way others are living theirs. But God knows what's right for us. And what are we willing to do to help bring about God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven? Ultimately, when Jesus says evildoers, he's talking about those who are lawlessness, those who lack what the law and the prophets have been proclaiming, the love of God, to put this love of God into action. My friends, the storm is upon us. There was uh, several years ago, I quoted American author Annie Dillard when she says, what are you expecting when you come to church? What are you expecting when you follow Jesus? She says, when we go to church, we should wear crash helmets and receive life preservers and be lashed to the pews in case God shows up. But in our cynicism and skepticism, pessimism, we lose sight of what's truly good news and what isn't. We are easily swayed by those who insist on proof rather than faith. Those who take the gospel for granted instead of relying on its grace. In other words, we, we didn't really expect anything when we came to church all these years. We didn't really wanna be changed. Maybe we really didn't think the storm was going to come, but it has. And so we didn't act and we didn't build our foundation on the rock. But there's good news for today. To be a follower of Jesus means that behaviors and actions, the manner in which we live out our daily lives, they are the artifacts, the evidence of that inner life of faith. This final story that Jesus teaches us summarizes the entire Sermon on the Mount. And the message is clear that discipleship occurs in everyday practices of you as a follower of Jesus. That discipleship occurs in everyday practices and actions as a follower of Jesus Christ. And that Jesus' invitation is an invitation to encounter to an encounter with God in a different way of living life. This life will provide the strength and the rock and the foundation in the present to withstand the storms. So let me ask you this question. Do you know when a storm is coming? Yeah, rain was predicted, but not the heavy rains that we got that caused the flood. We didn't know that this virus would overtake our lives in the beginning of March. It just seemed to be so far off. We don't know these things. So that means that every day we need to be ready. Every day we need to be following Jesus Christ. Every day we need to be doing something that reorients us, that turns us back to the word the words within the Bible that takes us back to prayer, that takes us back to centering. So that because when we start to go on that you know, as someone said, kind of running on the beach and on the sand, the footing is slippery and loose and you can never seem to get going. And so we can lose our way. And then when we reach that firm foundation, the rock of our Lord, how good it feels, how firm that foundation. But the actions and teachings of Jesus Christ that we follow every day, it doesn't need to be a burden. It doesn't mean we need to take this on like, okay, I got one more thing to do. I got to do the laundry, take care of the kids. I got to go to work. I got to clean the house. I got to pay the bills and I got to follow Jesus. Uh, that's not how we see it. Instead, it's a life-giving action. Yeah, you're going to mess up. I mess up. That's for forgiveness and grace and and being in relationship with others, being willing to say, I'm sorry, 
I don't know. I need help. Forgive me. But this invitation to participate in God's realm and the kingdom of heaven does require committed service. And we need to be tenacious about it. It's our response to God who shows us how to live through the life and ministry and death and resurrection of Jesus. Now our consumeristic society would have this simple confession of Jesus' name without faithful obedience. It would become a disaster, right? Yeah, okay, I believe in Jesus. And then what do we do? What do we do? Because sometimes we see religion, we see church. What are you going to do for me? Why should I belong? Why do I need to give my offering? What's the church going to provide me? It's what do you decide and how do you respond to what God is doing in your life, calling on your life, being in your life, that God has chosen you to be a child of God. How do you respond to the one who's giving you everything, who owns all that we have and receive in this world? Yet the foolish turn a blind eye, they turn away, they become anxious. Our true security resides only in doing what Jesus says. Maybe you have investments, the stock market's down. But who wouldn't trade that in order to have good health, right? Take away that money, but let me have my health. Take away that, let me have, be cancer free. Take away that and give me the death of the loved one back. This time starts, that we're living in right now, puts things into perspective. Again, when we look at this parable, there's two crucial differences. The builders had the materials. The builders heard what Jesus Christ was saying, but the difference was how they acted. Man, what a great time, church, for us to be out of the church. Because sometimes as a pastor, I'll, I'll, I'll get, I'm like, okay, people are coming to church, but what's happening? Are lives being changed? Are people living differently? Are they loving more? Are they fighting less? Are they more generous in everything that they do? Man, well, now it's a chance for us to be out in this world and show it. Are we willing to share if we've got two cans of beans left to share one? Yeah, I don't know. Will it come to that? Where do we trust this daily bread that we ask Jesus for? And give us our daily bread, not three months of toilet paper. Give us our daily bread. And so the one, the difference is, is acting or not acting. We must act on them, practice the, these teachings of Jesus and live them in our everyday lives. Storms, these times that we are in reveal a lack of foundation. Storms reveal a lack of foundation. It is in the storms that the difference between interested listeners and obedient disciples will be evident. It is in the storms that the difference between interested listeners and obedient disciples will be evident. How are we going to respond? Now, I'm not saying you should feel guilty for being nervous or anxious or afraid or feeling lonely or like you want to cry and all that. That is normal. That is okay. But we have our foundation. And where do we turn? And that we don't have to live in the sand that's being washed away. But as someone said, we can be prostrate, lay upon the rock, the foundation who is God. And as the psalmist do, say, Lord, hear my cry. See my situation. Hear my plea. You know that God hears that and loves us and is with it. I'm not trying to motivate you through this. I'm not trying to tell you everything's going to be okay. I'm saying the storm is here. But I know whom I'm going to follow. I know who I'm going to love. 
I've got an awesome church family. But together, we'll figure this out. Because this God who's prepped us for this, taught us this, and the actions that we've taken has created a foundation for us to move forward. To move forward. In the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew uses um, winds and water as metaphors for trials and persecution in life. In chapter 8, verse 23, begins where the storm is out on the lake and the disciples are scared in the boat and they see Jesus walking on the water in the storm. Where are we looking? Are we seeing Jesus around us? These teachings of Jesus provide the one foundation for living through life's storms. What we say and what we do needs to be inseparable. Just like vine and the fruit. That fruit is growing on the vine. Attached to it. As Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. So when are you building your house? We definitely want to build our house before the storm hits. But as uh, Miss Anita and Miss Hannah say in, in the video that they've created for our young ones, we can start building on the rock. Maybe we build it on the sand, but let's build it on the rock now. And we'll be sharing that video later today uh, so that you can watch uh, with all the, the youth and the kids. My friends, the strength of the house does not show up until the storm hits. Any house can look good. And when I say house, right, that's any person can look like they got it all together until the situation hits. And their true character Their true values are shown. The strength and character of us as disciples is truly tested when the storm comes. So again, my friends, as we close on this time together, to be a follower of Jesus means that behaviors and actions, which means the manner in which we live out our daily lives, they are the evidence, the artifacts of our inner life of faith. Discipleship occurs in the everyday practice of us as disciples and followers of Jesus Christ. Everyday practices. And this invitation from Jesus to follow him to build upon the rock is an invitation to an encounter with God and a different way of living, living according to the qualities of the realm of of God, the kingdom of heaven, love, grace, compassion, mercy, forgiveness, peace, abundance, generosity. It is in the storms that the difference between interested listeners and obedient disciples will be evident. So start building your house now upon the rock. Because the strength and character of disciples are tested when the storms come. The storms are upon us.